While we love the spiritual and intellectual aspects of raising our children, homeschoolers love making the connection between the theoretical and the practical. Our wonderful guest today, Inshal Shanae, is going to open up a fascinating topic, the importance of learning how things work. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Maladnik, your host, and today I'm talking with my fellow instructor at Homeschool Connections, the delightful Inshal Shane, about the importance of learning how things work. Inshal Shane and his wife are both proud homeschool graduates. He has lived in 18 different places around the globe since he was born in Bedford, Texas. Inshal comes from a family of seven, and his father served in the United States Air Force. After serving a year in net ministries, Inshal went on to attend Wyoming. Wyoming Catholic College and received his BA in liberal arts. He teaches high school science in Southeast Michigan and is currently writing his first book, Astronomy and Wonder. Inshaw is a certified COR backpacking instructor and a wilderness first responder. On the side, he writes sacred icons and runs a hobby farm. Mr. Shanae loves spending time with his wife and his three kids most of all. And you can find Inshal Shanae and his courses at Homeschool Connections. I have the link in the show notes. But if you just Google Homeschool Connections and Inshal Shanae, uh, you will find him. You'll find a page full of his courses and, you'll, and a video where you can actually get to know Inshal a little better. Inshal, welcome to the program. I'm so happy to have you here today. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's just a joy. Would you just step us into your background with homeschooling since that's kind of, you know, we're all living in that space and would love to hear what yours was like. So when I was younger, I went into a mixture of public and private schools until I was in middle school. Or it was right before middle school, actually, that I transitioned to going to homeschooling. It was actually because I got in trouble at school uh, for something silly, and I got an in-school suspension. <laughs> and then I had to sit there in one of the kindergarten classrooms and just do all of my schoolwork for the day on my own. And then after I finished all the schoolwork early, they just let me sit and play pinball on the computer. And I came home and told my mom that, and she said, why am I paying you to send you to this private school if you're having more fun working on your own? So we switched over to homeschool, and my whole family has been doing homeschooling ever since then. Wow, that's amazing. I love how God kind of lets us trip over into a new season, a new way of meeting Him and learning and all of that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, God is great. Yeah, little did you know when you made your silly infraction that, that God would draw out so much value from that. That's Awesome. And and a good lesson for us moms when we overthink and overworry our children's errors. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us a little about we're talking about how things work today. So what drew your attention and ignited your passion for this topic? I I think the thing that ignited my passion about the idea of the way things work and understanding all the objects that are around us in our day-to-day -day lives is an idea of poetic knowledge. We can talk about academic knowledge and we can talk about experiential or poetic knowledge. Uh, there's a scene in the book, uh, in Charles Dickens', Dickens book, Hard Times, where one of the professors is talking. It's uh, Mr. Gradgrind is, is talking and he asks one of the girls to define what a horse is. <laughs> the girl had been riding horses forever and then she just stumbles on the idea, uh, well, how do I define a horse? And he says, oh, you don't know what a horse is. And then he asks one of the boys, give a definition of a horse. And Bitzer, the boy, says, quadruped, gramnivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, four eye teeth, 12 incisive, sheds coats in spring, in marshy conditions, shoves hooves too, hooves hard but required to be shod with iron, age known by marks in mouth. And then Mr. Gregorian turns and says, now, girl number 20, you know what a horse is. <laughs> and that's 
that's the opposite of the type of knowledge we want on things. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> we can go through a physics class and learn all these mathematical equations on how things move together. We can learn in a chemistry class how an engine, like how like the chemical equations for fire, but we won't know how does a doorknob work? What's inside of it? What's happening? And so we treat everything around us as a, a magical thing that just <laughs> works because I bought it at the store or it came with the house and it just does what it does. And we don't pay attention to the things around us. Wow. So step us into also as this idea captured your imagination, what did you personally do with it? Well, the idea I was suggested to take this idea along with uh, David McCauley's book, uh, The Way Things Works. And he does a wonderful job. His book is filled with great, just detailed illustrations, and it helps capture the mind so much. Uh, I enjoyed looking through this book as a little kid, and both adults and children will enjoy going through this. My, my two and a half year olds, twins, will sit with me and look at how random things in the house, what's inside of them. And they just think it's really cool as they point out what's happening. Wow. I almost feel like the natural inquisitiveness of the human mind, like we want to know, why are we here? And why did God make us? And, and that leads us to questioning, you know, how did the universe come into being? And then God's creativity, and it links up with our own creativity. And, and, and I just feel like there's such a, almost a mystical connection with the laws of the universe that then become real in something as small as how a doorknob works. No, that's so true. When everything around you you don't understand how it works and it seems just random and anything could really happen. Anything could be made. Who knows? Because I don't understand how anything works anyways. That is an incredibly different mindset than seeing, oh, springs always work like this and levers always work like this. And there's a consistency through things. And there's an order that happens that even that man, when man creates, he's working with that order. You have a sense there's something higher and above ourselves. Amen. Amen. I love that. And you just sort of feel it in your bones when you start to connect those two ideas. What were some of the most interesting discoveries that came with this exploration for you? I, I love seeing with uh, the children, how the children kind of take it and they learn about a different thing and they get surprised about something or they ask a question that really is, oh, that's the thing that they need to uh, know or see. Just the other day, as I was teaching this course, we were talking about springs. And one of the students looked at me and said, do doorknobs have springs in them? And what the, one of the assignments they had was to find a spring. And I said, ask your parents if you can pull apart the doorknob on one of the doors. It's, it's a super simple thing. It's just a screw that comes loose and then you can see right on the inside. So I didn't give him the answer of whether or not a doorknob has springs, but he was able to take it open and look at it and that opened something up for him where we were talking about springs in general and now he noticed something that he went through every single day and now knows, yep, there's a spring inside of the doorknob. Yeah. And so his question led to him taking action and him making discovery. And what kinds of, um, I don't know, like what connections are they making? Are they, you know, more, just more delighted in ordinary things? Like what are tend to be the learnings? I hear from parents uh, many times that their kids will all come down after a class and they'll uh, be looking around because every, every class when I teach the way things works, almost after every single class, I have them find an example of the tool or the function or the thing that we learned about. And so they're looking around their house and they're finding where something is or whether something has this or not. And they come over to their parents and be like, 
there are bevel screws in the blinds. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just super cool because there are little, you know, bevel, bevel gears and whatnot in everything all over the place. <laughs> and you don't notice it. Wow. I mean, you come from a great college, Wyoming Catholic, and I don't know a lot about the programs there. I know that there's a lot with the outdoors and doing and survival and and being away from electronics and really thinking and being. I can't help but thinking this foundation of getting ignited about how things work will help more young Catholic people think of themselves as being able to make other things work, as being able to produce something unique, that it might, might ignite that capacity in them, as a lot of really good liberal arts programs do. Oh, that, that, is, that is my hope. Uh, we don't build anything in the way things work. Uh, class would be hard to do online uh, with students, but I remember back when I was in high school, I was on a homeschool uh, robotics team. And being able to build something with the other, the other students, put something together, and actually have an experience of how nature can push back against you is incredible Ooh. i mean i've done a lot of outdoor trips and i've led a lot of backpacking trips and canyoneering trips and things like that but those are all this same type you feel nature push back against you where there's something that you don't just have control over and we are so often especially now that we have all these digital things around us we're in a world where the only thing constraining us are other humans or our own weaknesses. And we get an idea that, oh, the only order is the thing that man makes. Mm. And then naturally, you see this in politics and uh, the cultural movement. We want to move that to everything in the world, right? We want to say, oh, not only is everything around me things that man controls, and man really can decide whatever he wants, on how this program will work or that computer will work or whatever. He can really do whatever he wants with it. Then we get that turning to our own selves, right? We can do whatever we want with our bodies or our definitions of ourselves because man decides everything. But when you have an experience of nature pushing back at something, when you have an experience that, no, springs work this way. They, they only work in one way. Levers work in this specific way. Hot air always rises right these these fundamental things you have this realization that man isn't in control of everything man doesn't get to define everything man has to work in god's order Ooh, i i love this so much and i can just taste it but flesh it out even more inshallah what does that give us when we start to come up against, not against, but experience that pushback, those immutable laws in the design of the universe, where does that take us next? I think that this gives the foundation in the student's mind to even, even just not, not only thinking about the wonder that they receive from seeing the beauty of, of creation and seeing the consistency of creation, they also, it's a foundation that that wonder is here and now, not just over somewhere. There's beautiful places out there. No, the wonder is all around us. And that consistency, that understanding is a subconscious foundation, a poetic foundation that is going to help us be able to actually do academic things well. When we're thinking about further scientific knowledge, whether chemistry or physics or whatnot, we have a grounding in reality as opposed to what most students have, which is just a kind of sort of grounding in maybe math or something. And they're trying to link it together. And it feels like this hard thing that they don't want to deal with. Wow. I feel like it takes us out of a prideful place. We become humble before yeah. the laws of the universe, right, that are designed intentionally, that work for our good. And so that littleness, that humility that we understand paradoxically as Christ followers, that littleness sets us free to hold the hand of God and, and experience things in unexpected ways. No, that's so true. That's so true. Right. We need, we need to see how little we are in, uh, in God's world. So cool the way something <laughs> practical and elegant and real can be a foundational lesson for our lives. Yeah. Tell us more about the course itself. What do you teach and how does it 
How is it being with the kids in that environment? So the course, the, the course is wonderful. We we basically go through this entire book, the way things work now. Uh, it's the it's the, he has a new uh, revised edition that adds some things like LED screens and other more modern bits of tech. Uh, but we go all the way through. We start with things simple, the inclined plane, right? The simplest machine, which is just a ramp. And then we go more and more complicated into screws and cams and gears. And then we get into fluid uh, pressure and heat and engines, uh, how lights work, how paper is made, how printing happens. Uh, we even actually go through um, how coding itself, just in a general way, functions, right? What does it mean for a computer to be out of ones and zeros? Um, uh, there's there's a great he uses a great analogy where he basically just has pumpkins traveling through pipes, <laughs> as you imagine. Instead of dealing with wires and stuff, he gives this nice physical thing that you can picture that gives us an understanding of oh how are the messages sent? How do we talk about things? And during each class, I go through the book parts of the book with them. We talk about it. I oftentimes find animations. Uh, that people have made of the thing. So they have a kind of 3D model to see how things uh, fit together. And then finally for their homework, not only do they have to read, they do a little uh, quiz. They also have to find something that is using uh, what they learned that class. Oh my gosh. I, I got to tell you, my hair's almost standing on end because I want to take this course myself. But <laughs> there's, there's like a little neon sign flashing in my mind. Do many girls take this course? Actually, I have a lot of girls that take the course. Uh, most of the courses I find are a little more boys than girls, but it's close to half and half. That's so good to hear, because I feel like when I was a little girl, and I'm in my 60s, when I was a little girl, I literally remember being told by my wonderful dad not to kind of horn in on him showing the boys how the engine worked and how to do minor repairs, because don't worry, your husband will take care of that for you. That's kind of unheard of now for our kids growing no. up. And homeschoolers especially are very like, let's all learn together. But I just wondered, is there any lingering kind of separation between this kind of mechanical fascination um, for boys and girls? And it's nice to hear that it's roughly equal in terms of enrollment. Yeah, and and both uh, both groups are seeming to to get it and and take it uh, uh, take it in and, and understand it. I, I do find that the boys tend to be the ones that are the most excited in most of the class, most excited about it. But that's just uh, how it is. Yeah, I mean, boys and girls are different, but we certainly do have female engineers and physicists out there who are very passionate. Uh, and yeah. both boys and girls are surrounded by all these things. Yes. Right. We're, we're all sorry. It's the same reason why I think it's important for every single boy needs to know how cooking works. Right. It, 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 things you can, we can talk about things being traditionally this for this group or traditionally for that group. But the, the important thing is everyone, everyone should have a knowledge of how the things around them work and how they function. And that goes back, even if you go back to older societies with really strong gender roles. There are the, the men are going to understand, even if they don't have practice, they're going to understand the process of baking bread and they're going to understand the process of milling wheat, even if they're not the ones doing it all the time. And the same with uh, with each other's tasks. Yeah. And and this is a total side note, not terribly relevant, but I know more and more families where the husband is the primary chef in the house, including mine. <laughs> After years of it being me, just these days, it's more my husband and he's having a ball in the kitchen. So <laughs> love that. Love that. Um, so are we, I want to just step back into, when I read your bio, mentioned your astronomy book. Could you say a little bit about that book and and whether or not we're going to get a course on that? So the astronomy book, it's, it's actually a similar uh, idea in a way to the, uh, the way things works, where I want to aim at the poetic knowledge of things. I really hate most astronomy books. They do a terrible job because <laughs> they go through and they turn the constellations into a weird connect the dots where it looks nothing like the creature. You look at it, it's like, this is a bear. No, that's a group of triangles and lines. I mean, a child will draw a better bear than that. Mm. But when I went out in Wyoming, I took an astronomy course out there where we could see so many stars 
and it focused on we're not going to connect the dots of of astronomy. We're going to look at, at the stars and do you see that? Do you see what shape is there? And if you stop thinking about it as a connecting the dots, but the forms and impressions that appear in the sky, you can actually see the different figures that are done. So this this astronomy and wonder course is aiming at the students drawing. Uh, uh, if, even if pretty simply, uh, drawing the different shapes over star fields that they can go and find at night to really avoid the whole, we're going to do a connect the dots thing and make things work and really make it about what are the shapes that we see in the stars and how do we bring those shapes to life and learn about the movement of wow. the stars. I love the way, the name of your book is Astronomy and Wonder. Correct. I got that right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you have another course coming up soon that connects the spiritual and the scientific. Can you tell us about that? Because that's super exciting. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, as much as I do a lot of science courses, my specialty is in theology. Uh, I'm about to finish up a, my master's in theology right now. Um, and And so... I really love the sciences and I love understanding them and I love theology and the area that the two seem to butt heads the most is in the topic of evolution. And I have a course that I am doing, which is on that idea, right? Evolution, how do we understand it theologically and scientifically and how do we synthesize those understandings where we're not doing an injustice to either? We can't hold... We can't hold theology. Well, theology is here and it says this and uh, science is here and it says that. And we're going to hold them separate. Or we're going to say, well, theology, you don't know what you're talking about here. I'm paying attention to science. Or science, you don't know what you're talking about here. I'm going to pay attention to theology. We need to breathe with both of them and bring in the truth that is found because truth does not contradict truth. Mm, amen. And anything we can discover that's legitimate and science is of God. It's all exactly. part of his creation. Yeah. Yeah, I love the marriage of the two. And I understand that at Homeschool Connections, students will be able to find this course in both the theology and the science department. Yes, they should be able to find it in both. Yeah, and when does that, um, this this uh, episode will air during the spring semester at Homeschool Connections in 2022. So uh, tell us when this course can be had. The evolution course, I am actually currently running through it the first time with, with a group of students. So by the time that this, uh, this episode airs, you will have the recorded of the fall semester. The recording will be there um, that people can go through. And then by the time you're done with that, the spring recording should be done by the time summer comes along. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. So everybody, um, before we wrap up, I just want to remind you, you can find Inshal Shanae just by Googling Homeschool Connections and Inshal Shanae. And his name is actually quite easy when you see it. It's I-N-S-H-A-L, Inshal, and Shanae, French, C-H-E-N-E-T. So for those of you who are a little bit familiar with languages, Inshal Shanae. But if you just put in Inshal and Homeschool Connections, he'll come right up. And it's spelled exactly the way it sounds. Um, take us out with any final thoughts on anything that we've covered today, Inshal, or anything else that you think is important. I think that it is so important for us to have a poetic foundation in the things that we're learning. We, we, they need to come alive to us and be real to what's around us. If we don't have that, then all the academics, all the theology, the philosophy, the history, the, the chemistry, whatever it is, is going to feel with the same question that students seem to ask all the time. Why am I even learning this? Am I ever going to use this? What's the point of this? And students ask that because they don't see how what they're learning is connected with reality around them. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I love that. We even, Homeschool Connections a few years back even did a whole book on why do I have to learn this? And so I feel like, you know, your philosophical stance on education is sort of like locks right in with the underpinnings of Homeschool Connections too, which is to, to have that learning that makes sense that really gives real value to our kids. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for making time today with busy, busy life. Oh gosh, it's been a delight. And and we're going to have Inshal back again in just a few weeks to talk about drawing with art theory. Another one of his courses, absolutely fascinating. So be looking for that. And again, thank you, Inshal. And thank you, everybody who tuned in today. Don't go away. Stay tuned for our short feature coming right up. Hi, everyone. My name is Chantal Howard. Welcome to another episode of From Ideal to Real, here where we unpack homeschooling challenges so that you can better wrap your heart and mind around how to bring the ideal of all of your dreamy ideas of what homeschooling should be into the reality of everyday life. So today, I just wanted to come to you and share with you a couple of thoughts around when our challenges in life begin to invade our home. It's a challenging season right now. The world is at war. People are being torn apart by politics. And it's very easy for us as parents to be agitated and irritated because of the responsibilities that we have to pay attention to the outside world. And oftentimes that begins to overflow into the tensions in our home. And so I just wanted to offer you a couple of simple ways to remain grounded in the truth and to remain peaceful and calm as you approach your children and talk to your children about challenging circumstances. So the first of all, it, first of all, my first tip is to just remember that we are made for greatness and we're made for challenging things. Even our children, they have a capacity to weather storms and to be resilient. And so even though oftentimes we may not approach things the right way or overshare or even expose them to things that may be beyond their capacity at the moment, we are we have the grace of God on our side to heal, to nurture, and to rebuild. So be gentle with yourself as you discern how much to share and how much to withhold. Uh, that being said, I do think it's important for us to envelop our kids in the conversation of what's happening around us with delicacy. And to remember that in that same light that we are made for hard things, they have a capacity to understand and desire to be brought into the conversation in an age appropriate level. So when we're talking about difficult circumstances or facing the future without fear, the most important thing that we can do, tip number two, is to make sure that we're grounding our conversations in hopefulness, in gratitude, and in positivity, just because all of the saints, even in the hardest of times with their lives on the line and being martyred, faced challenges with joy. And so let that be the meter. Let that be the metric of your home and know that the Holy Spirit provides the fruit of peace. And so if you feel tension and you feel strain and you feel stress, then this is perhaps a, a moment for you to recalibrate and a moment to go back to sit at the feet of the Lord, to bring your children to adoration or to have those discussions within the context of, of hope, that we are the hope, we are the light of the world, we are the salt of the earth, we've been he set here to set the world on fire, and that amidst challenges and trials, that's one of the reasons why we love what we do as home homeschooling families, is we have the opportunity to transform, and to transform culture, and that starts in our homes. And then my last thought for you today is to be attentive to your tone. They say that 7% of what we communicate comes out in our words, 38% is our tonality and 55% is our body language. So those two latter components, our tone of voice and our body language convey so much. So can we speak about challenging things in a way that is gentle in tone and comforting and consoling in our body language so that our children can receive what is necessary without being uh, prompted to fear or to despair or to any kind of, uh, of response that would, um, would be less than holy. So those are my tips for you today. And obviously this isn't just about wartime. It's about anything, right? We can convey hard things to our children, uh, with a gentleness and a conviction that will last and will stand. So I hope this is helpful for you. I encourage you to keep persevering in the midst of the wheat and the weeds. That's where we are. We are growing in, our children are growing up in this place and time where those two realities coexist side by side. And we trust 
that God's will and providence is perfect for us. He has us where he wants us, the time he wants us, and with a mission of greatness before us. And that ultimately, my friends, is the intention of our homeschool. So reset <laughs> reset your course today, your intention to do well and keep persevering. All right. That's what I have for you today. I look forward to another moment with you here at From Ideal to Real, and I hope that you will continue to surge forward and persevere. My name is Chantal Howard. You can find me at Chantal-Howard.com, and I look forward to having you follow me along on Instagram as well at catholic.oil.mom. Thank you. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.